Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The tribe Call Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! What's up? I'm Elia Einhorn. Welcome back to the Talk House Podcast. Joining me from Chicago today, my guest is... Josh Modell, executive editor of Talk House Music. What's up, man? We have a very cool show today featuring Jawbreakers Blake Schwarzenbach in conversation with Chef Graham Elliott. This talk took place live in Chicago at the Virgin Hotel. And Josh, you curated this event. I did. So it's funny. Uh, you know, I've been aware of Graham Elliott as a chef sort of long before he was a guy on TV because he was sort of a superstar Chicago chef. And when he was first kind of getting started in Chicago, somebody pointed out a picture of him to me in the paper and said, is that a jawbreaker tattoo on that dude's <laughs> arm? Nice. And uh, indeed it was. He's got the sort of jawbreaker 4Fs logo. So his restaurant was was very close to the AV Club office where I was working. So we got to know each other a little bit. I ate there a bunch. And he was always inviting bands in to the restaurant to come eat for free when they were in town. Eventually, he became the culinary director of Lollapalooza. So he's responsible for like the great food that's that's at Lollapalooza every year. And he and Blake have gotten to know each other a little bit over the years. So Blake happened to be coming to Chicago on vacation last month. And I said, hey, let's get you guys together uh, for a podcast in advance of this Jawbreaker show coming up on November 4th in Chicago. I love it. I've, I've been a fan of Blake's for a long time. He was, of course, the singer, guitarist, and songwriter in Jawbreaker, active from the mid-80s to the mid-90s. And then after that, Ben went on to form Jets to Brazil. Yeah, and Jester Brazil is an amazing band that had a little more critical acclaim maybe than Jawbreaker. Um, but over the years since Jawbreaker broke up, the legend has just built and built and built. And they seemed like one of the, the last bands that was ever going to reform. It just didn't seem like it was going to ever happen. And then last year, Riot Fest made it happen. Amazingly, Jawbreaker played their first show in something like 20 years at Riot Fest in Chicago last September. Can we give big shouts to Riot Fest? I mean, they have reunited some fucking amazing bands. It's kind of insane. Like the only thing they have left is either the Smiths or uh, somebody dead that they'll <laughs> resurrect from the grave. Well, Josh, I will say true story. I was just talking to Johnny Marr of the Smiths about this last week, and I can say pretty definitively that Smiths reunion ain't going to happen. It's funny that you say that because Morrissey just sent me a text that said, fuck Johnny Marr. No, that's not 100% <laughs> not true. Please don't sue Talkhouse. That did not happen. Oh, man. These guys are emo godfathers and sort of like Neutral Milk Hotel, generations of kids got obsessed with the band long after they'd actually broken up. Totally. And the extra funny thing about that, which you'll see in this Jawbreaker documentary that came out last year called Don't Break Down, is that the kids at the time hated their last record, their, their major <laughs> label debut. They, and that's basically part of the reason they broke up. They sold out, man. Exactly. And then you know, 10, 15 years later, all the kids love it. It's their best record. And they were able to come back and now they're touring, playing big shows. And that film, Don't Break Down, features interviews with, uh, of course, Blake and, and the band, but some very cool other guests. We have Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. We have the legendary Steve Albini. And of course, Graham Elliott's in the movie being, you know, another superstar fan of the band. He's a huge fan of the band, and that, that really comes out in this conversation. Now, Elliott believes that all chefs are failed rock stars. <laughs> and I will say, Graham Elliott is a rock star of the food world. This is a guy that spent many seasons starring alongside Chef Gordon Ramsay on MasterChef. Between that and MasterChef Junior, he spent 10 years with that franchise, only leaving to go to Top Chef. I don't know how he does it all, but dude also stars on Bravo's Going Off the Menu. Graham Elliott has opened two fantastic restaurants this year alone. That includes Gideon Suite in Chicago and Coast at MGM Hotel in Macau. That's his first restaurant in Asia. Yeah, man. How does Graham Elliott even sleep, right? <laughs> in this amazing kind of wide-ranging episode, they talk about perfection versus authenticity in the recording studio and in the kitchen. Right. We hear about the inherent pressures of reuniting with a legendary band or being asked to recreate classic dishes in a high-pressure public environment. We'll hear about Jawbreaker's formation, rise, and reunion. And the consequences of speaking out politically while being a star on Top Chef. They also get into wet sax solos, guitars, auto-tune, Trump supporters at Jawbreaker shows, menu B-sides, being tied down to famous songs, and that classic beef stroganoff from 97. That was a good beef stroganoff. <laughs> Listeners will let the guys take it away. Jawbreaker fans will definitely recognize Blake's voice. He's the much lower of the two. Should we roll it, Elio? Let's do it, man. 
Do you have such a deep voice? Like, I'm gonna, I'm I, gonna use it. Some of my mic technique that I've picked up in the last year. So I'm usually like, I, I don't know about you. So when you listen to yourself after you've recorded, and maybe you kind of self-analyze, but I try not to watch myself on TV. But like, I do, and I realize I'm like nasally and such a high pitched kind of person that I, I get nervous. So when I do interviews or like TV shit, I'm like. Uh, so tonight what we have is three ingredients. And then I taste the dish and I'm like, oh my God, it's so good. I think it's a mate. And like, I go like, Whoo. so I don't know. I hope that doesn't happen tonight. I'm going to try to get nice and low. Yeah. Should that, we talk see, about, that, should we talk about vocal fry? Yes. Let's you know go. about this? Do you read about it? Vocal what? Vocal fry. What's vocal fry? See some, some nods. Oh, you guys know about it? So do I then. I Felt really <laughs> left out until I read about it. Explain, please. Well, I think I'll explain the fry technique, cooking wise. You explain vocal fry. Let's see if you're right. How would okay. you fry a voice? I mean, ooh, like let's say ooh, a voice hour, box. Yeah, we're already going like, <laughs> like in a way different different level. If you had a set of Clint Howard's vocal cords, and you wanted to bring them down to kind of a sultry level, what do you think you would do? Well, I am a firm believer in that everything in the world can be edible by frying it. Like I could take that shoe <laughs> and batter it and marinate it and season it enough and cook it and crisp it to where you'll taste it and be like, it's a pretty good fucking shoe. Like that's pretty good. So, I mean, again, that technique, vocal cords, no issue. But now tell me about vocal frying. As I understand it, and I'm not an authority, but it is a way of speaking where you keep your voice to an absolute minimum. It's kind of compressing and dropping the voice to almost a speaking level. Does that sound correct yeah. to you people here? Yeah. Vocal masters, anyone? People claim that it, the young people today do it, do it kind of pathologically. I didn't think anyone sang for real nowadays. Like, you know what I mean? Like literally, like the, the whole uh, auto-tune, pro tool, you can make yourself sound like anything. Like right. does anyone really have to sing anymore? And this, like, again, we're not me? starting what an interview. Like, we're just talking. Like, Listen, no, but really, like, you know what I mean? Like, same thing with cooking. We have a thing called sous vide, which means under pressure, right? So, like, or under vacuum. I can take a piece of beef, cook it to 140, which is mid-rare, no matter what, sear it at the last second and serve it, and it's always going to be consistent and perfectly mid-rare. But there's no craftsmanship or artistry to it. You know what I mean? So it's like there's, there's, it's no romance. It's not sensual. It's not beautiful. It just creates a great end result. So it's like, what do you think? If you went into a studio and recorded, do you think about the person listening to the music and saying it should sound amazing? Or do you say, I'm all about being genuine and just recording to like my phone or a four track. And if it, my vocals crack or something's out of tune, that's just part of the deal. Like, like, what do you think when you do that? Because that's how I cook. I really, I don't care about the, not that I don't care, but like the end result is one thing, but I love the process of getting there personally much more than just making something consistent and tasty. Yeah. Well, I used to have this discussion with Jay Robbins a lot because he reco I recorded three records with him. Right. And I was so self-conscious in recording my own vocals that I would often want to comp vocals, which is where you actually do multiple takes mm -hmm. and edit the best single take out of that. Kind of an a, um, ominous precursor to auto-tune. Right. Because you're cheating in a way. You're editing right. the perfect, the dream performance out of like four different passes through a song, if that makes sense. So yeah, we would but do you get self, not self-conscious, but do you sit there and like, one of those things of like, I'm never going to be satisfied. Like I'll take a thousand takes of song X and I like this one, but the one like 20 takes ago, I, it was this, but didn't really hit that. And th like you yeah. can go in a circle for that's, fucking ever, right? I think I that's mean, what's happening in production is that because of the unlimited exponential right. possibilities, people spin out and keep perfecting. Yeah, like and, you'll never record it. Like- you can just yeah. go on forever, right? So I was going to say that in those discussions, it would be Jay and I at the board deliberating over which was the best she said, let's say. That's the yeah, lyric. Yeah, yeah, sure. And he would always 
vote for the one that was a little more like despondent and distressed. N note value was not present, but the kind of crisis value was. And he would say like, you know, I like this one. And I'd be like, I know you would because <laughs> that's not the good one. Like, the perfect one is over right. here. But I was hap I'm happy that I deferred to those, a lot of his ideas. I went for like, let's get the really vulnerable one. So more, to answer your more question, authentic I, or like emotionally. A once in a like, lifetime take, I think, right. is, is what uh, ultimately what people respond to. Maybe not at the rate mass radio level. Now, right, right. But, but I think that's what people hang on to. But now when you're playing a live show, like right now, if you're acoustic or it's 10,000 people, Jawbreaker, Reunion, Riot Fest, whatever, is that more important, equally important, less important than when you're recording with Jay to an album. Like for me, it's like a cookbook. Like I cook every night at the restaurant, 100 people come in, it's great. A cookbook, it's like a lasting monument forever. Like it's the closest thing a chef has to an album to yeah. where in 96, you record Dear You or 95. And then 30 years later, it's like this mythic, you know, incredible album. Do you realize that when you do it? Like this is committed to tape forever. Or do you say, yeah, that's what I felt like at that month when we were recording, but I'm going to always play this live and that's way more important. Like, how do you balance that? I, I don't know. I, I do think that and I'm a little um, paralyzed by it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think you can be quite easily. And, and I'd like to be more stuff, free right? and play it spontaneous in a studio and say, fuck it, we're just going to get the best, most passionate live take we can. So now that you Going forward. Now that you've quote unquote reunited, whatever, whatever anyone calls it, right? Like, to me, in a kitchen, it'd be like a certain time in my life would have been when I was like 27. It was the first time I ran my own kitchen, like as a chef. I had three or four people, so it was like a band. And I always said, let's throw aside titles. We all want the same end result to be like the best restaurant. You might make sauces, I cook the meat, you make, like, doesn't matter. We should be able to all move different stations and, and do our own things. It's not like one's better than another. And, and you're hoping that you create chefs by the time we break up, right? Like Adam can go and start a band, you know, Chris can go and do hit, like you're all equal. You play different instruments or different parts. But when you get to this point, you know, you look back at it and you're like, okay, we're now getting back together and we're gonna cook food. You know, is, is there a higher or heightened level of, of anxiety because people remember you or they read an article about you when they were younger and it's like, oh my God, they're like, I'm going to have my life change when I come to the show now or if they record a new album, it's going to be the fucking greatest like breakup album of all time. Or do you as an artist just say, that's cool. Like whatever you guys want out of the album, that's great. But I'm going to record whatever I feel right now. Like it's, a, it's what I want or what the band wants. I think we're always going to record whatever we feel because it'll, it'll only be the thing that we can write. Right. We're not going to be able to write any other thing than what we do. But thanks for bringing it up because now I am terrified. <laughs> More anxious they're like than ever. <laughs> enormous expectations. And there is that if you let it into the room. But we're, we are trying to write now. And right. we're also trying to remember how we wrote as this band, which is a very weird, I've never done that before. Totally. I'm like, doing. Because it is this band. It's not Forgetters or Jets to Brazil or which, Why Saul Lane or. You Which know. will lead me into another question, but and again, I'm not trying to like lead the fucking conversation, but I, but I'm doing a charity dinner in, in three weeks in Kansas City with two other chefs that I happened to work with like 18 years ago. Which again, to me, I guess when I was younger, 18 years sounds like 5,000 years ago. But as you get older, it's you know what I mean. Time changes, but like Jesus, decade and a half ago. But they told me. For the menu, what if we recreate dishes that you did when we worked together? And it's like, okay, like, I get it. That's kind of cool. But at the same time, you're like, you know, do we do something new of where we're feeling right now? Or do we go back? And how do you recreate that feeling? So like Blake, Jawbreaker, 89, 92, whatever. You left, broke up, whatever happened, and you do Jets to Brazil, like when you go and play now and you're with your guys, you've been together for two and a half, three decades now, you're playing, do they say, we appreciate you and we love you as a brother, fan, whatever, 
we know that at this point in your life, you wrote Sweet Avenue, you wrote CNN, Conrad, whatever. We love that song too, just as fans of music. Put it on the set list. Or do you say, that's like telling my ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, uh, let's go to this restaurant because me and my current one or whatever, like love this place. And you know it's going to upset them. So you can't touch that. Like, is it off limits? Or do you guys all talk and say- Oh, it's totally off limits. It is. It Absolutely. has to be this to this or new stuff. Yeah. It's, it is. Yeah. Because it's not the Blake it's, show. It's, con- it's not, people aren't coming to see but, me. I mean, I'm a critical part of it. Who, come on. No. Honest to God, who's, right? I mean- If, if it's going to have legs- Like it can't be, I mean, maybe we could get away with the Blake show for one season, but people are coming to see the band that, you know. No, I know what you mean. And I I mean, not out of any great ethical strength I have, would I not play those songs, but I just think it would be um, dishonest and unfair. No, like, that, I to, mean, to that the, totally to, makes sense. To the other I, I Jets who wrote those songs and right. to my okay, band, see, like, I don't want, they don't want to play someone else's song. They do like those songs. Right, that's, that's what I mean. all I need. To- because, I need them to go like, dude, that was a really good song. I wish we had it in our band. But, but do you feel that if Jawbreaker kept going, those songs that were on Orange Rhyming Dictionary, et cetera, et cetera would those have been Jawbreaker songs? Or you broke up and you're like, finally, I can fucking break out on my own and <laughs> do this song. You know what I mean? Like, Or sure. is it... It's like John Lennon, right? The Beatles break up. I always think about this. Beatles break up. You go and listen to George Harrison or, you know, Lennon or McCartney. And it's always like, what would the Beatles have have done next after Abbey Road? Or what would they? And it's like, well, listen to all their individual stuff. And probably an amalgamation of all that would have been like the next Beatles album, you know? And, And so I wonder, would that Jets to Brazil album had been the next Jawbreaker one? Or is it completely different? You felt unchained and you could finally do something new? It was pretty unchained, the feeling, but that had very much to do with um, the members of that band of Jeremy and Chris and I, who wrote that first Jets record, were all coming from bands that were very pinned down Mm -hmm. in terms of what people expected of them, kind of from like a punk or hardcore background. Right, right, right. And all of us were like being really experimental and brave as musicians because we all thought of ourselves as self-taught and not not qualified to play the Beatles, let's say. (laughs) You know, but we did. Like in our little room, we were like, let's have a, let's try this kind of song. I was listening to this record and and we learned between the three of us how to do that kind of music. Mm -hmm. And I, oh, I so think it's, it's, imp- it's the ingredients in right. large part, like the people I was working with. Well, that's the thing. I want to make sure people know that this isn't like a, a jawbreaker. Like, I know that's what you're doing now, but like, clearly you and I, the arc of our beginning and where we're at now and where we're eventually going to go is totally different, right? It's, it's a mix of all our past experiences. So I don't want this to be like a jawbreaker chat unless you wanted to. I mean, there's, there's no rules clearly, but, but when I think of this, like you have jawbreaker and it's, It's got to be an amazing thing, but also a weight on your shoulders of feeling like you have to live up to that. And that's me being presumptuous. I I have no idea what what you wake up and or go to bed feeling like. But Jets to Brazil, equally, I think 97 or 98, when this comes out, there are probably a lot of people that heard that. I remember seeing you guys at like Cat's Cradle with the promise ring and like then, you know, 930 Club or whatever on that, that tour. People that saw you then that maybe didn't even know about Jawbreaker. They just heard you guys and you're like, it's fucking great. When you start forgetters or something else or or going solo, doing your own thing, do you now have like double the worry or like you feel (laughs) like there's an expectation of like Jawbreaker was one thing and now there's fucking Jets to, like I got to live up to this shit too. Like, or do you not worry about that? Because I, I mean, I do. I always have to think about I just cook for me and I, I like to make my food, but I also know that people are going to come in and be like, that Caesar salad you did, or I love the stroganoff from 2007. It's like, I don't want to be tied down to signature dishes. You know what I mean? I like to just yeah. cook however I feel, but people still have that, that idea. Like they want to hear want, they want to hear, you know, boxcar. And like, how do you deal with that? That's a, that's a good question, Graham. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to like throw you for a loop. I'm just like, I, I'm not 
even looking at other people, I'm just wondering, like between us, like what's, yeah. well, what do I mean, you I do? Think the How do you deal you're, with it? You're kind of asking is like when you let's call what we do, uh, we we're creative in some way. Sure. So we'll call it art. Like what? Mm-hmm. Who who do you make your art for? Right. And I know everyone has to ask themselves that who does creative writing or work or teaching or whatever. And I think it's kind of it's a hard thing to figure out because you you write for yourself. I, I'm just gonna say writing. Sure. You're writing for yourself to yourself a little bit, but you also have to be acknowledged that there's another voice, uh, another set of eyes in the room, somebody who's going to look at your work. Right. Unless you just want to lock it up in a garret, you know, and have it discovered after your death. But like, so like, how much do you play or perform to that imaginary audience? For me personally, what I've, experienced is, and again, I don't know, like as a chef, right? I dropped out of high school, started as a dishwasher, moved up and being a chef was like a a craftsmanship. I knew that I could throw my knives on my back, tomorrow move to Barcelona or, you know, Bangkok and and knock on a door and get a job because I know how to use a knife. And, you know, I always say cooking is taking something raw, whether it's pig intestines or $3,000 white truffles, you have a fire and a piece of metal and you turn it from raw to cooked. Every type of, uh, you know, religion, background, nationality, part of the world does the best with whatever they have. No one wakes up and says, I feel like cooking snails and frog legs and a pig's head today. Like, that's what they have. And you can't judge them for it. You know what I mean? Like, that's their thing. Nobody wakes up and, and just has $20 a pound ahi tuna flown in from Japan. Like very few people have that, that access. But, you know, you, you do what you do with what you have. But as you move along, the, like the expectation changes. You know what I mean? Because you've been written up in articles. You sold X amount of albums. Uh, you know, you, you've been mythologized. Like I was mentioning to someone earlier. Like imagine if the Smiths got back together right now. Like is there any way that Morrissey and Johnny could ever live up to that expectation. Like, did you, did you feel that? Did you think like, I know I, like journey, I, Steve Perry was like, we're, I'm never playing again because there's no way I want to mess with the memories that people have of like me hitting 20 octaves. I can't do it now. I'm not, right. I'm not going to do it. Like, do you think of that? Like I had that concern with jawbreaker, not in the Steve Perry way, but it's like, <laughs> If I could Blake, hit the Blake right Perry. <laughs> non-octave, you know, my like shattered <laughs> voice. I used to do the best Blake impression ever. Oh, I'm not going to do it now, but. But I was concerned that I couldn't do a good Blake impression anymore <laughs> of that era. And it kept me out of it for a long time. Did I said it? no. I was the probably the holdout of the three of us for years. Because I just really? didn't think, yeah, I kind of thought I'd learn to sing a different way. Yeah. over time and a way that I could sustain my voice and not blow it out every night. So to go back to that was pretty daunting. And I, I definitely didn't want to do it if it wasn't going to sound like the band that people remembered. Like the whole out, outpatient, like your, your polyps, right? Like what happened yeah. with that? I had a polypectomy. I had a, a callus like Bill Clinton had. Most famous polypectomy, I guess. But of all time. A lot of public speakers get it. Just repetitive stress yes. on your vocal cord. So I had it removed in, in Europe on tour and my voice went up an octave. Like the next time I sang, they had just you, cleared you out finally this hit manhood. You were like, I'm, I finally achieved. I got I, to I, Norway. I, Oslo was the next show. I was so psyched that I had my voice back, although I was singing way too high. And I broke my <laughs> guitar during that show. My, the one left-handed guitar we had. So we just got out of the OR and then we were out of a guitar. Tour, That's tour, like jawbreaker style. Just like tour, tour cutting song. off the knees every chance you get. True or false, you sold your white guitar on eBay like 2000 to when? I sold my black Les your Paul. Your black Les Yeah. One, a black Les Paul. I saw it. I saw and it on there I, and I was like. It's the law of conversion. I, I wanted a keyboard for Jets to Brazil. And that was the, I got the amount of money that I needed to buy the keyboard the digital piano <laughs> for the beautiful vintage analog guitar. <laughs> Anybody so ever, that. have you ever seen the hard times news, which yes. is like the music version of the onion. There was one the other day where it's like guitar sales down for 484th month in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it just reminds me. There's not a huge market, I guess, for like guitars or 
electric pianos, as, as you as you had mentioned. Yeah, but, although at that time there was, there were very people were really starting to play keyboards and bands a lot at that point. Let me ask you this: every not hit song, but like think about like eighty through eighty three, eighty four to like eighty eight. All of the big pop songs had like wet sack solos, yeah. right? From like Lost Boys, like the dude on the beach with like the the, the glossy <laughs> thing. In excess, all, you know, hungry eyes, right? Like Eric Carmen. Duran all Duran the, yeah, on the raft to, with the memories out on the skiff. God, damn it. <laughs> Please let that be your next video. <laughs> but like, how, what happened to that? Why did it drop off? And no one for like the last 25 years has ever incorporated a sax somehow, unless it's kitschy. Let's what happened hope to the sax? That's kind of going to be the story of auto tune. In ten years, on extreme auto tune, where it sounds like a vocoder, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. gimmick that like share began begat. Life believe, after li 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 right? I believe <laughs> that's the, the first like really I, popular use of it. Yes, until today, which is crazy, it's a, and it? it's a queasy feeling, which is kind of a pop earworm. I guess people react to it. True, either, either they're compulsively drawn to it or they're repulsed by it. I was reading a book on Phil Spector and it mentioned that in like 1967, like he's recording and one of the people that he had singing had such a loud voice, they had to put her in like another room and it was Cher because when they recorded, it was so out of control. It was like, put her 20 feet behind that fucking wall wow. and now she's cool. And then you see what she becomes. And I don't know, I think Cher is super cool. Like I do she too. owns it, Gypsies, right? Gypsies, like, Tramps and Thieves. It's Amazing. a college favorite of mine. Yeah, is it? It's a great song. Where, great song. What was college for you? Where, where, or what? Yeah, yeah. And what was it like? I'm guessing you weren't like the leader of a fraternity or something. No, like, I that's, was in New York. Uh, again, I'm not judging or. But. <laughs> <laughs> I did not pledge. You didn't. No. You pledged Nor not to pledge. Well, you're the anti fraternity. I knew I wasn't going to get in, so I was like, eh. <laughs> uh, I went to NYU. Okay. Uh, with Adam, my drummer, and um. And we met Chris there. That's kind of where Jawbreaker started. Mm -hmm. And we went to be in a, we went to go to college, but we also wanted to keep our band going from high school. Adam and I had played together. So what was that band called? Red Harvest. What was the name based on? Dashiell Hammett's book of uh and You guys were intrigue. fucking artsy from like high school, huh? We're just LA kids, like LA <laughs> detective fiction. <you> know. <laughs> LA detective fiction. <laughs> Yeah. It's the it's next true. album title. It's incredible. <laughs> but we were, we were not going to stop being into music. And so we right. went, we probably went to go to school there, but then it turned out that the education was in downtown New York music. Because at that point, which was like 86 through 90, there was so much good stuff happening in New York with Live Skull and Sonic Youth and Swans. And right, right. All those people were like that scene was really burgeoning along with like DC hardcore and it was just really a rich time. This is what's so funny, right? Like when you think of the 60s, right? You think of like Vietnam, Kennedy being shot, you think of Martin Luther King, riots, whatever, right? But there was so much other shit going on that led up to that. Like when did the 60s officially start? You know, like when did people start seeing it as this? And I think of the 80s, like my brother and I were driving around, right? And like Kim Carnes' Betty Davis Eyes is on, and it says like 1983. At the same time, like Minor Threats playing two or three years later, you know, you've got Dirty Dancing soundtrack, but the Pixies were playing. Like there's this whole underground of shit going on that people don't associate with that time, right? Like 80s music is new wave keyboards and really weird hair, like Flock of Seagull, but all this other stuff's going on. Like, what do you what do you think defines that? Is is it MTV? Like, what's going on now? Like, like, how do you think you define what's happening in music? Like, how do people know what's out there right now? I, I don't know. I think we kind of gloss culture superficially in the mm -hmm. moment. Certainly, our media does for us. It takes the you know the hive quick view, quick pass, like that little Google car that drives around, little like rotary. I love when you look at something on Google Earth and you see the shadow of like the ominous car with the camera on top. Yeah. Yep. Or you but just see one of those things driving around. I've never seen one. Have you? It. I've never Absolutely. seen Absolutely. San Francisco. Really? They're all over the place. So here's the thing. I used to associate you guys with Bay Area, but you're 
New York. You live in Brooklyn now, right? Like, and we started in New York. So, uh, so what do you think happened? Like, is it because Spotlight was on you at that time? Yeah. Well, no, it's fair. I think we we really moved to SF to to be in a band, and that was a city that we all agreed we could stand. What What led you to that? Was it like? We Gilman like, Street, kind well, of, you know, like yeah, it like, was actually, but a lot of it was the San Francisco scene, which was more the bar, like experimental music. It wasn't like we need to get signed to Lookout Records. No, like, but we loved that scene, and we play, we would play Gilman. We would also play the Covered Wagon or one of the dive underground music clubs mm -hmm. that were a very different look, scene, like Steel Pole Bathtub or very noisy right. Bike Messenger Speed, you know, gnarly San Francisco, and like that. We were at that age where we kind of. Actually, age-wise, we were more in step with that group. Do, I'm trying to think, like, what do you think of San Francisco now, right? Because, I mean, that's the huge story is. What do you I, think of it? Like, could you cook there? Food, no. Is there any so way to So many open chefs anything? and restaurateurs have closed shop because rents used to be, you know, I'm going to go to the Tenderloin and pay 6000 a month, and now it's like 25000 Like, no matter what you do, you will not be able to survive, much less break even, make a product. Like, no one does it. Or they close shop and go somewhere else. They go to Oakland, and now Oakland is getting more expensive. So it's similar to in Chicago. Like, are chefs going to just end up moving? Like, a lot of chefs are moving to Detroit because you can find a space, same size, downtown for like a fifth. You know what I mean? I don't know, like you have history there. If you go back and you realize like Facebook, Apple, Google, all, the, all these people now want to live there. And I totally get it, right? Like if I was 20 something making a lot of money, I wouldn't want to go live in the fucking, you know, Silicon Valley. I want to be in San Fran. Supply and demand, it's $6,000 for a studio. Like what do, you, what do you do? Do you see something politically like mayor should do that? City council should do this and- or do you just kind of like, eh, it is what it is? I can't speak to uh, civic matters in San Francisco. I have enough of my own to wrestle with in Brooklyn. I was getting, like, in Brooklyn. Manhattan's yeah. no, you know, no picnic of either. Of course. Or, but or you're Brooklyn in Brooklyn, no Brooklyn right? I mean, Manhattan's actually cheaper than Brooklyn at this point, I, I believe. Like, parts of it are. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm fortunate that I'm in a rent control studio that I got. I've not moved in 21 years. Really? Let me tell you that. Right now. What made you settle? That's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> no. I stick around. Uh, kind of guy like smart. Like I either, totally no, wouldn't too leave scared, either. Probably to leave the nest and then then it. But I like prefer to look back on it as wise and side sagacious. Note, you know. Side note: I wasn't going to bring. Up. <laughs> I I do the show Top Chef. Tom Calico's the judge, the main like chef dude. He's kind of moved in the last few. Years. Like ninety nine percent of what he talks about or tweets, etc., is politics super liberal, calls out Trump every, like that's all he's doing. He just got a space in Brooklyn for like him and his family. They're, they're turning this into his home. Yesterday, somebody spray painted all this like political shit all over his house. Like, what do you do? Like, how much do you, Blake Singer of Jawbreak, like all that, wear on your sleeve and accept the consequences? Because like for, for me, I'm on a show that's on like, network. Yeah. I know my followers. I can look at, you know, the, the, the demographics and the info. And because it's like a network show, everyday American, like these are the people, if I go on and I'm like, fuck Trump, like that has major consequences, regardless right. of who I, and, and you want to still believe what you believe and share, but like, at what point do you, do you try to balance what you do? Or I don't know, as you get older, do you not yeah. care? Like, no, what? I'm just, I'm not concerned with that because uh, our audience, we're in the bubble, you know? I don't think there's many avid Trump supporters that come to a Jawbreaker show. <laughs> You're not there's doing a Jawbreaker some. rally? There's probably some. I hope there are, actually. You know, people who happen sure. to like our music and they, they can hold those two ideas yeah, yeah, yeah. in the same place. But I'm not worried about, like, in the way that you would be because I don't actually live in the real world in the, in the music scene. Sure. In the way that, not that you do on Top Chef, that's an unreal world. No, 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 right. But you do interface with this America that most of us don't see. And I know people talk about this and it is it is shocking when you come face to face with like outright nationalists or racists. And they're in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. I have a sure. very reactionary. I mean, right, they're everywhere. Hood. It's like termites and fucking infiltrate everything. But but to hear someone freely espouse that and like with the bile and vociferousness and anger in their voice and realize they're totally serious, 
is a pretty formidable thing to run up against in a human being. You're like, wow, they, they really do, but they're not being duped. Like this guy is right. filled with hatred and wants revenge for his life being shitty. Right. So in terms of what I do, I try to just do things that I think are going to be useful because I don't want to add to the noise like of everybody right. knows what's wrong. Everybody who knows knows what's wrong. And I don't want to, I don't feel a need to contribute to that. Do you, and I, and I know that you're- you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm told, and I know that you're, I'm not going to change minds, right? In that, but that and level. I know that you believe what you believe. You're political. I mean, I think I think everyone has to be nowadays, right? No, it's not acceptable to put your he head in the sand and be like, well, you know, I I don't vote, or I kind of just go like you really line in the sand have to say who you are. We every season move where we're going. So we were in Charleston, then we were in Colorado, and this season it hasn't aired yet. Was in Kentucky and in Louisville. And I'm going around and I'm like, you know, not like I'm running for office, but like I, I've been to all 50 states growing up and with my dad in the Navy, talk to everyone. I want to hear all these stories. And I'm, I'm hearing people like, well, my dad's got an opioid addiction and I've worked three jobs and I Uber and I did it. They don't give a fuck about like global warming or, you know, Nancy Pelosi. Like they, they don't. Like there's a guy that comes out that's like, I agree. I hate DC too. And I have my own money. Come, you know, join me. And they're like, done. Like, no one says they love this guy or what he stands for. Like, they're just doing that. Like, so do you, when you go on tour, you know, I know, I know you've played select cities, but say you went on a 50-state tour, you're playing everywhere, and you go to some place in Wyoming or, you know, wherever. Do you look at that and think, like, you know, this has changed my outlook? Or do you say it's my responsibility now to help change their outlook? Or do you just say, I play music and, and we're leaving tomorrow in the van and like, I do what I do? Uh, no, I mean, I definitely value traveling more now than I did when I was like slugging it out, where it was mm -hmm. really a matter of physically getting through it and right. keeping your body together enough to do the performance. That would keep me, my head down a fair amount. Now, I, all of us like to be where we are to like be where we're playing sure. and see the town or, you know, interface a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I would love to have my mind changed or blown by local circumstances. Um, I just... Or, or change theirs. Just, I mean, somehow, like, I mean, yeah. again, you don't want to be presumptuous. Like, I did a, an event here, and if I'm like, you know, I'm going to cook this. Oh, by the way, fuck Trump. And everyone's like, woo! I did the same, like, line in Wisconsin in Green Bay crickets and everyone's looking at me like we're gonna fight later after this demo we're gonna have words so i'm like uh i meant fuck hillary and then it's so like Woo! like is that the more productive moment where i don't crickets know what's happened but for me it's like i spend 40 minutes cooking everyone asks me about gordon ramsay it's fun and then you do your thing and take picture everything's cool but like when you really try to go like the next level deeper like i don't i don't know like you walk away with a better understanding, but I, I still don't have, I, I didn't have the opportunity to like try to sway anybody, you know, but yeah. you have a bigger platform. Like everyone, list, like they watch what I do because I wear white glasses and I'm on a cooking show. People have like lived and died by, you know, what you write and do. And I know you said it's not but the not Blake show, people. but like, <laughs> no, no, well, maybe not. But I mean, there's gotta be some dude in North Dakota that put, kissed the bottle on a fucking breakup tape, you know what I mean? In a mixtape and, and hoped it saved his life. Like, right, you dear know, you, that's the whole strange, title. It's a strange venue to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing that is worth considering, I think, is we're all products now and brands. Yeah. For whether we like it or not. Sure. And there's this strange expectation, well, in like what we might call late stage capitalism, there's an expectation <laughs> that it's, it's an exchange of goods and I'm giving you... $55 to come see your band. So keep your fucking politics to yourself. I, I'm here absolutely. with your boxcar and kiss the bottle and drink beer with my friends, bro. Right. It's just like and taking like, a knee. I've Are you taking a knee? I signed that contract to a certain extent I, by saying like, hey, I'll take this amount of money to come and play this Mondo Fest. Sure. And, you know, when you cook or sell food, you're saying like, I'm here to provide sustenance and interesting food and that's it. And what's so funny- So it's a strange, you know, we're- we're Absolutely. all locked into that a bit. I, I know this mostly from education because I have friends who teach and I talk. Sure. And there's a strange 
culture emerging where students look at education as a product. You know, that this is a four-year program that my parents or I'm buying or I'm taking right, right, right. enormous debt to do. Exactly, forever. And you work for me. Like, I got this as an adjunct. It's like, buddy, you work for me. Like, you don't tell me about this stuff. It, it's a very strange, you know, we're all Absolutely. being kind of marketed in a certain way. And that that's what I'm, it, it's like, if you're on like a weird artsy Netflix chef show that has like, tiny amount of viewers and they're super foodie. Like you can do whatever. When you're like this massive network thing where you don't have to pay for cable, it's just on. Like people watch that and it's just like NFL. They want to watch someone throw a ball, catch a ball, score, and that's great. But as soon as somebody's like, I'm going to take a knee, I'm going to call attention to all this stuff, going, people lose their fucking minds. And it's like, does that make you want to do it even more? You know what I mean? Or, or do you players sit there and go like, I'll, I'll keep my politics on the side and just play the sport. Like, I feel like now more than ever, and I don't know if it's social media, 24-hour news site, whatever it is, but like people feel like who they vote for, what they stand, like that's them. It's an extension of them and they have to stand for that. But you, you feel like you can separate it and you're like, I play my music regardless of if you're left, right, center, whatever, and enjoy my music, and I'm not going to sit up here on stage and try to preach. No, I'll t I mean, I will fight, you know. I will fist fight. Yeah, and I will yeah. talk shit forever. Right. I just got in a little hot water out in Portland, actually, for coming down on the coders. <laughs> the thing is with me, like, I'm too busy up here. I'm not going to win any big battles. I like to go after little fish and just fucking <laughs> fry them, you know? And the guy, the guy came up to me after the show, and he's like, punch down. Punch up. Excuse me. What I do, he was accusing me of punching down on the poor co disenfranchised coder culture. <laughs> in Portland, Oregon, right? Yeah. People in Portland are looking I, for I, shit to fight about all day, no matter what. But yeah. So, so you're I mean, going to keep I will, punching down totally or what are you going to do? Punch everywhere. I mean, I'm, I get up there to, to do my thing and it is our time. You know, we, we take that pretty seriously. Like we can go off on stage and say whatever we want and maybe shake things up. But I think what I su maybe succeed at is just imagination. Like disrupting language and being off the wall and creative in the way I speak or in the way I could carry myself or we play music in a hyper masculine music in a totally goofy un masculine way or whatever it is we're not consciously trying to subvert any paradigm or you know thing but it's just the unlikeliness mm -hmm. of guys like us being our band now and then and writing the words that we do right that's all i can do and i hope that and i do trust that it does it it comes down to people who get it who was you know you when you, you were young or these people that, that actually connect with it and they're like, I'm not alone mm -hmm. or I'm going to be braver with my thinking because of that totally off the wall record or thing you heard. You're like, well, I didn't know you could speak that way. So for, for me, what I've always, like I've always said as a, as a chef, I love to take like the cooks and people on my team to the art Institute or, you know, MoMA, wherever we're at and, and say, okay, Mondrian started painting this. And then he stripped everything down and was like, primary colors. I'm only doing this, you know, or Van Gogh. And, and you look at how thick he laid the paint and you, you stand up close to it and you see the texture. As an artist, not a craftsman, like a, a, a craftsman can season, sear, this, sauce, done. Can look at music and play whatever Beethoven wrote 300 years, right? But an, an artist is someone that's saying, let's fucking play Beethoven backwards. Like, let's do something cool. Like, let's take that dish and flip it upside down. That kind of thing. Like, when you're trying to find your own voice, like, how important do you think that is? Like, balancing art and craft, you know, and, and reinterpreting things. So if you were going to go play a song, right, when you make a, a set list, to me as a chef, it's like, you know, me doing a tasting menu. How many songs do you give the, the audience versus you. Like if, if you're, you haven't slept in a week, you're so moody, you just got through a breakup and you're like, I just want to play all the weird shit off Bivouac that that's what I feel like right now. I'm not going to play Boxcar, Kiss the Bottle, any of this other shit. Fuck the crowd right now because I'm an artist. 
Like, <laughs> do you do that? Or do you say, no matter what, like, two for them, one for me. Two for them, what, like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, That's how do you question, do that? Yeah. Like, really, like, when you play, like, can you, like, do you go to see the Rolling Stones? Like, I haven't seen them. I probably wouldn't. But you go because you want to see Satisfaction, Ruby Tuesday. But what if Mick Jagger is like, fuck all of you. I don't feel like it. I'm going to play this album in its entirety that none of you like because I don't care and that's what I feel like and I'm Mick Jagger like do you do that like I'm Blake I'm playing all the b-sides none of you can sing along to sue me fuck off like you know what I mean or do you feel like I have to play this and it's not a trick question I'm honest because I do that again as a chef like well, I know I you guess love I'm this. Gonna ask you the question: Have yeah. you ever just done a like "fuck you"? This is my night yes, menu. Absolutely. Where it's all B sides. Uh, yeah, like, but a lot of times it's because I want to start a fight. Like I want right. someone to go on Yelp tonight and do that, so I can challenge them to a duel in the alley. Yeah. Like if I felt like serving uh, tonight's tasting menu is two hundred dollars for ten courses. Jinx, you're getting fucking ten Caesar salads in a row. Like, <laughs> sorry, sucker, you fell for it. Because I'm an artist and I feel like doing that tonight. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they're all going to go home and be really mad, but I sleep well because I'm an artist. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. do you ever do that or do you feel like, I hate this song? Like, like Pearl Jam. Do you think there's ever a show where they haven't had to play Jeremy? Like, they probably hit the tape deck and, like, walk around and, like, it just, I don't know. you know? I mean, they like, seem like a band that does what they want. They more do than, a more lot of times, but I'm... St- they, I agree, but I still. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the jam way, dude. Are you? Kind of. You I'm not. Kept, I don't know them, but um, Vitality I, was a very important record to me. What like certain songs or just like as a as a, Corduroy. versus Corduroy's great. The bridge in Corduroy, the the the, the transcendent dun, part dun, does something dun, for dun, me. Dun, dun. Yeah, no, it's a, it's great. I love that. Versus got me I, through high school. Oh, yeah. Twenty four hour and dear, you got me. After high, after I dropped out, that got me like post GED. But I, well, I guess like, I, I take exception <laughs> on their behalf because to me they were really interesting when they clearly like the Fugazi imprint reached them, and they I think I mean I could be speaking out of turn, but I no, felt no. like they were just like, hey, what they're doing is really cool and smart for them and other people. Let's do it for our band. It was this enormous like stadium hair metal band at that point, right? Like ten or whatever, totally. And they just started doing this like doing it as this, like, this is our business and we run it exactly this way. I don't know how long that went or how deep it ran, but it seems like they've just kind of kept that model going. Did you ever get to that point where it was like, okay, you know, major labels, whatever. Like, so apparently Pearl Jam had, right? They had done 10, they've done Alive, Even Flow, right? They did Jeremy and they had a video for Black. And after Jeremy, they were like, no more videos. And the label's like, no fucking way. Like, you have to, and they're like, nope. And then the next album, they're like, we don't like Ticketmaster. We're not going to play anymore. We're going to play, like, this high school gymnasium because we don't like it. Like, they absolutely threw everything on the side. And like you said, like, Eddie Vedder loves the Ramones, Minor Threat, Fuga, and they made that album after Versus, the biggest band in the world, and they went in a totally different direction. Like, you know what I mean? Do, do you do something like that where the expectation now is so high after, you know, what, Un- Unfun came out in like 89, like literally 30 fucking years ago, three decades ago. If Jawbreaker puts out a new album, is it going to sound like the other thing? What if it's like a ska album? Because you guys all for the last few years have just hung out in the Caribbean and just like love that kind of thing. Right. It's like the Jawbreaker reggae album. And you're like, if you're a fan of Blake and company, You'll fucking dig it. We have talked like, of going to Jamaica just to rehearse. You're Jamaican me crazy. All us, Come all on. Sandinista. Like, we want it. I actually <laughs> floated that idea. Like, hey, we made some money. Let's just go to the islands and hang out. We're sober. By the way, I should add that. So we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be like drinking rum and smoking, but let's just go to the islands and see what happens. But see again. We could throw the tapes away, it'll be fine. Like, I always say, and not to turn it into me, but like as a chef. Totally to turn it into me. But as a chef, like, I'm not from France. I'm not from Japan. Like, I, I'm not beholden to any one cuisine. I can be inspired by, like, wherever I am. Like, there's no right or wrong. It's just gray area. So if I said I just traveled through Italy for two weeks, I'm going to come back, close the restaurant for a few days, I'm going to do an all-pasta menu because I feel like it. P- 
people that come to the restaurant hopefully know who I am or what the restaurant is and buy along for that idea and like come for the, you know, come for the journey versus we only like these few dishes because you've always done it. Like, you know, do you feel that there's like a uh, um, responsibility to keeping that going? Or do you feel like if you guys trust us enough, we're putting out the fucking polka album of your dreams. Jawbreaker polka 2.0 is going to change your life. This is okay. all we're touring with. And honestly, that is all we've ever done. Polka? Like, no. <laughs> See, you're putting polka in my mouth. <laughs> I've been accused of worse things, it's but... The worst. <laughs> it's just the the record we've made every time is the only record we could write, and that's every song that we're... I'm a real plotter. Like, I'm not prolific, and it takes me a really long time to figure out, to remember how to write a song, because each time I write, it's a totally new process. Got it. So I think when Dear You came out, it might as well have been polka. No. Would have gone over better if it was polka. People I, fucking hated I it. I remember seeing you right after that. And, and here's what's funny is I, I was just telling my brother, I have like the ticket stub. It's like, it's like Jawbreaker and Fluff or Jawbreaker and Smoking Post. It was like 95, 96 in, in D.C. But I asked for your autograph and you just wrote Blake huge, like <laughs> caps across the whole ticket. Like that, I still have it. But I, I just remember looking at that and, and you said, and I don't know, if, you know, I think you said it, in an interview for one of like the local DC rags or whatever. But in, in hindsight, I've made it to where you like, you said it to me because we were really close that night. But it was like, Dear You came out and it's on a major label, blah, blah, blah. It's the same fucking record we would have made regardless of like where it was or how much money was behind it or what label it was on. Like this is what the album was. Because I think people heard it and they're used to like, you know, this type of vocal, this whatever, and it comes out and it sounds prettier or like, you know, in a, in a different style. And I think a lot of people maybe at that point say, oh, they're on a major label and it sounds like this. And you had mentioned it would have sounded the same thing regardless of whoever put it out. Yeah. Well, it would, I mean, all the records that we made sounded really different from one another mm -hmm. because we were changing so much as people and as music makers every time. Um, so dear, if Dear You had come out on Revolver or uh, on Lookout, it, mm -hmm. it would have been the same set of songs. It probably would have sounded different, I would say now. I mean, the performances would have been the same, but it would have sound, it sure. wouldn't have had that lush Rob Cavallo production. I don't know that it would have been any more popular sure. or not. And I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. Were, were you I'm trying heard to answer your question no, 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 from no, before, but now question. I don't know what it was. Would, and there's no right or wrong thing, but like, so emotionally, right? Well, if I do a menu, I put my heart and soul into every single dish and I want to please people and I want to please myself and the team. There's 20 people working 15 hours a day, coming in, receiving product, prepping it, making it, serving it, and then cleaning their little station at the end of the night. Like they own that. So if, if they serve ahi crudo with whipped avocado and you said it was salty and they hate it, that one person has trouble sleeping that night because that's an extension of them. So if you put out an album, regardless of if it was a major label, it was like you and Adam and Chris, or, you know, or you and Chris Daly and whoever, like putting this stuff together and, and putting it out, like, and, and there's a negative review, like Pitchfork shits on it or you know, 100-star review and rolling stuff. Like, how much of that do you take to heart? Because for me, like, everyone's a critic now, right? Social media, yell, whatever. And you try to tune it out. But, like, last night I sang the seventh inning stretch at, the, at Wrigley Field for the Cubs. I looked at it and someone's like, Graham Elliott's hat's three sizes too fucking small. You know, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, who wakes up and says that shit? And then, like, off time and off pit, I'm like, I'm not like a sing like I was all chefs are failed rock star. Like we wanted to sing and we didn't succeed, so we cook. But this is my one chance and you still shit on me. Like so like do you put all this time into music and then you see a review and you're like, that's cool, fine. Tomorrow we rock Portland. You know what I mean? No, no, like I singles? Can't. Like or do you <laughs> fucking hate it and you're like, I'm gonna take that guy out one day if I see him at the show. I, I just take it I take it home with me, you know. I have to live with that for from that day yeah. forward. 
And I tend not, like most people, I tend not to forget the really offensive stuff and I, mm -hmm. to quickly forget the kindest word that someone might say to me. Like, I don't care what they say. I had a great time yep. tonight. I love your band. That's right by me. But the, you know, the person who I have no connection to said like, and the really, and I don't know if you feel this way, yeah. it, it is the middling review that is the killer. We do 100 which, covers tonight. 99 people are like, greatest food I've ever had. One person's like, I liked it, but you used to have this dish and this one was okay. But I, And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I go to bed like, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> I've done everything I can to make you happy. And like, you're still, and that's the shit that keeps you up. And it's, it makes me feel weak. But at the same time, it's like, maybe I got to try harder. But yeah, it makes me throw the away the good review, right? Like, four star, like I throw it away. I'm like, I still got to please that one person that hated the potato dish. Like, right. Now we're getting you, into the, the Freudian I know. self. It's because my dad didn't like me enough it growing all go, up. <laughs> it does. It all goes back to like those early critical relationships. Of, That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I think about it all the time. Like, who are you trying to please? Why are For we so you, who is it? to please others? For me, it's dad. Always dad. For me, it's mom. Really? Absolutely. So my dad was in the Navy. Growing up, was gone for like eight months at a time on a ship. And, you know, we traveled everywhere. But when he came back, it was like super emotionally like disconnected. Like people say, oh, your dad's in the Navy. Was he like the super, t not at all. My dad had like a copy of the Bible next to the Quran, next to like the Hindu book of the day. Like he was very spiritual and smart, but like absolutely cut off from everyone. So your whole life is trying to like please him, right? So like I'm, I'm on a TV show. I finally did it. And it's like, well, I watched it and it, it kind of looks like it's Gordon Ramsay's show and you're kind of like the backup dancer. Like, are you going to get your own where you're kind of like the main guy? And I'm like, I'm trying. All right. So so anyway, what I was at, you know what I mean? And you're like, oh my God. fuck. Like, Have you, do you watch Sports Night? You ever see that no, show? No, no. Aaron Sorkin, best, best television show ever made. I'll really? tell you right now. I'm just telling you. Not suggesting that. Pre uh, West Wing. Okay. But there's it's about two sportscasters in a third rated sports show. Yeah. And uh, Josh Charles plays one of them. Dan Rydell is the sportscaster. Yeah. Always trying to please his father, <laughs> who cannot be pleased. And they, there's a scene you described happens beautifully in that show. And one it's, episode. It's weird because he's now at like fucking what 140 years old. He's like self aware. You know what I mean? And he told me like your mom would spend 10 hours making like a chili with like 18 ingredients and she would, you know, name them off to me and I would taste it and be like, it's really good. If it had like cannellini beans, it would be, it would be over the top. You know what I mean? And she'd be like, I hate you. And that's why I've hated you for 40 years and should have left you. And my mom was right. Steve was better. You know, and it's like that kind of shit. And he's like, I, I know it's bad. I just don't know how to fix it. And so like, I don't know. I feel like I'm the opposite where you could serve me a burnt piece of shit and I'm like, it's delicious. Like, you're so talented. You're so, like, I'm like overly nice because like you're trying to like make up for that stuff. But it's, it's funny that as you become, you know, I always say the world's six billion years old. You maybe live to be a hundred. It's gone in a second. You're with your parents for 15, 20 years, somewhere in between. But like that formative time affects everything. Is it, it's crazy, isn't it? Like yeah. mom or dad or anything. Like, I don't know. So I just hope everyone gets a chance to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Like, you, first of all, you have to live long enough and then be patient enough with, have good enough friends or partners to tell you like, did maybe you there's feel something that, there. Did you have that support system from New York to San Fran and back and touring and all that other stuff? Like, do you feel like you had a core support system? I've always had really good friends and I stayed friends with some high school people who are still going to be my friend. Like I kind of stopped making friends at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Didn't know how anymore, but I have, I've been, yeah, I'm really lucky that way. And my parents are both pretty, pretty generous and like open to uh, talking with me about things. What did your parents do? Dropped out in the sixties. Is that, are you asking like yeah, like, like growing up, yeah. Like your my dad, dad was a was auto studying, mechanic, your mom was a teacher. Like what, my what did My dad was do? studying architecture at Berkeley and dropped out with his best friend, uh, I think around the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. to protest that and became a contractor and started designing 
buildings, became craftspeople, as you say, and moved up to Oregon. Worked and, with his hands somehow, And yeah. rehabbed, restored old houses for years. And my mom was a horticulture student, botany, wow. and is, because, is now an organic gardener. That's and rad. farmer. So are you a for food person at all? Like, I don't think I foodie, but I mean, do you like- because my mom taught me how to cook, and she they cook all- Homegrown right stuff and before it was cool and what like people were paying forty dollars a pound for heirloom tomatoes yeah like you just cooked it because it was good like you she knew how to grow stuff they learned along the way yeah mm-hmm. I mean she she and my stepfather took over an old growth forest in Nova Scotia in the eighties let's say they bought it and um, committed to maintaining it against deforestation and plunder and so they now have this. They steward an old growth forest and there's wow. garden, organic gardens. It's a beautiful place. Do you have a passion for that at all? Like in, you live in Brooklyn or, I mean, do you have like a rooftop garden or, or no, apiary no. you want to like have bee? Like or nope. you, you appreciate it, but you don't want anything to do with yeah. it. Or I what? like that it's there and I get to go to it and then yeah. come. It's like people with kids. You're like, I love to go hang out with your <laughs> kids. And then I get to go home to my bachelor you, apartment. Would you ever want kids or like, was that a conscious decision of, I, I love, don't want kids? I love kids, but no, I don't. I'm 51 now. Yeah. I don't think it's fair to them. If I had kids now, you know, I don't think it'd be fair to have a 70 year old As a dad father, as versus a, like, I don't want kids in this world right now because of how the world is. No. It's not that. I'm not against that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm just wondering, like, because, yeah, not, I mean, my brother right here, like, you know, same thing, right? No, 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 I'm just saying you don't want kids, and you mentioned earlier about, like, overpopulation, like, that was the main thing, like, don't want to add to the shit going on, like, so. But is is that the main thing, <laughs> or is there something beneath but, that? Why did your voice get so deep? <laughs> You're like, hey, is that really what it's all about? <laughs> okay. I'm looking for uh, voiceover work. Done. This is what I think. I got I wanna, you. Next Pixar go movie. Books on tape. I'm going to put it out there on the podcast. You, you could do it. Right? Do it. And I, <laughs> I have a little home studio and I would love to read people's books. I would read, I would read fucking Tom Clancy. I, for will you, you please read the, my next book? For the book. right. Will you please read the recipes from it? I, I will do, read your book. I, wanted, I was going to call it Appetite for Consumption. I want to do a, a food music cookbook. So, like, Country is like rustic, home cook, whatever. Like punk is like, you know, street food, like anti-establishment. You know, pop are like dishes that everyone's seen before and, and kind of read. I, that's that food music, you know, symbiotic relationship where ingredients equal chords, you know, for a dish and a song. And these ones equal, you know, the, the album where there's three hits, couple that I like and blah, blah, blah. Like that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, the way you describe choosing and presenting food to me does often sound musical. Whether it's like you're releasing a record that mm-hmm. week in your restaurant or you're DJing, for lack of a sure. better term, but like, hey, I'm going to give them this mix of, you know, I want to draw these elements. So it sounds like a great idea. You look at the first stuff that you guys did versus like the last song you recorded. If you had to say, this is my tombstone, these are the three songs that define me, not as a band, like, Jawbreak, you're reunited. In three years, Jets to Brazil is going to go and play four-cornered night beginning to end at Riot Fest. Like, what do you feel are your three songs that you've done that are you? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to say that right now. Any I just one? Don't think I or that would maybe like... Pin it down. I mean, what in the set for us now, I mean, for me, it's Jet Black, it's um, Bivouac, and it's Accident Prone. That when you play, Those you still songs. feel like, I mean, you always feel emotion, but like, same thing. If I cook a dish, which one still ignites that, that pattern? Like, fuck, I love this. Like, I realize why I made this. Like, when you play accident prone, do you go, that's, that's me in July 94? Like, yeah. it ended up taking this long to write, but it's more it was one of those her, songs was, where yeah, you're like, like how. How did we ever, as a three piece, write this? It's so right. orchestral in a weird way. How many layer? How many and guitars are like layered on that? There are not that many, as many as you would think. Really? Yeah. It, it's like the wall of sound. Yeah, but like, you know what I mean. It's, it's actually like, only three guitar tracks, I think. Wow. I think Rob Cavallo just told Adam that recently, to, to all of our surprise. It's amazing. But it, yeah, I, I think those ones that are kind of accidental and happened in a spontaneous live writing situation, like the three of us. 
hammered out that center passage mm-hmm. in that song where it's like we're just kind of improvising and something cool happened and we were lucky enough to remember it and make it, we don't write music, but to say like, let's keep doing that. But like Jets to Brazil, right? If you look at what you played and you look at the the arc of it from, you know, first song to last song on Perfecting Loneliness, like which couple out of that, and again, not like putting you in some weird box that people will quote later, but like which ones do you look at at that era? Like I, I was a chef here, then I worked at this restaurant, then I owned my own restaurant and now I'm here. But like I can pinpoint certain things I made at certain points. And even if they're not relevant now, like the whole amygdala thing, like it pulls me to that moment. Like, do you look back mm. and say, this song is, even if it wasn't the hit, you know what I mean? Like, that's me. That's what I remember and what I love. Yeah. Post I mean, Jawbreaker. There, like, there this- are specific songs, but I think it's more the feeling of like that breakthrough moment where you begin to create something that you didn't know you knew how to do before. Like musically or lyrically? Yeah. Uh, do you both. think, like lyrically, They're you've always consistently me. been amazing. Do you feel as like a guitarist? That's not or, true, actually. No, I no, mean, it, it is. Come on. True. It isn't like, true. There's some pretty lame lyrics in the early days. Yeah, but I really, mean, st- like, strip it down in, and go read the lyrics to Busy. Whether It's like Morrissey or, or The Smith. You pull it down, you read the lyrics to that, and it doesn't matter what the music is to it. Like, it could just be like a journal entry or a poem or anything else, and it's it's great. You put it to music. Years later, it could be whatever, but same thing, like, but do you feel excited as you got older or more mature or better at your craft where you're like, shit, I used to play three chords and, you know, we're at Gilman Street, but now I'm in New York and I have like a studio and I'm playing the, and like I can actually play a keyboard in this and these chords and I can finger pick that. And I can, like, do you, is that what excites you? Like actually getting better as like a musician? I, to me, it's mostly singing, the chances. Vocal. like The risk, because the, ri- the stakes are much higher emotionally to, to do something like that in front of even an engineer or your friend who's recording you or to put something like that out in the world. The voice is the most fallible, and I'm not known as like a singer of, you know, technical ability or anything. So I'm always, and I know most singers feel this way, like you always feel like you're a fraud, in a way, you're like lucky to be getting away with it one more night. It's so buried under guitars. Like without that, I'm not so funny. You said I mentioned to someone earlier, Anthony Bourdain mentioned as a chef that like any artist, musician, chef, poet, painter, whatever, the minute you quote unquote make it, whether it's critical acclaim, money, fame, or whatever, is like the moment you can't sleep at night because everyone's gonna fucking call you out as a fraud. Like that, that's what you feel, right? Mm-hmm. Like you wrote a best-selling book. You're a chef on TV, and you're like, God damn it, every real chef is now going to be like, that guy sucks. That guy can't do, you know? And like, But would it you be live from, with that, from envy, from kind of maybe, professional envy? I don't, I don't know the next step behind that, but that, that was his thing. And that when I read it, I was like, absolutely. Like, I, I started as this, became a, a real award-winning chef, and then got into TV. No, Nobody ever started as a chef saying they want to be a TV star. Like maybe nowadays, right? Like you played music not expecting to be some major guy. And Professional if- reader. <laughs> That's what the goal was? I'm going to ink a deal with Avon, HarperCollins, the, all those that- people. <laughs> so that someday I can look back and say, you know, I never, playing Riot I- Fest, I never thought I would be <laughs> America's Never top thought reader. I was going to be. Playing with the Misfits reunited, like down in the next stage <laughs> over. <laughs> Do you, would you ever put out a book? I'd love to write a book. Of like poetry if, or if fiction, I could write a book, or what would you be? What would it be? I don't know what form it would take, but if I could just write a book, then I would definitely put it out. Again, I'm just looking at it's the similarity. Like it's, Morrissey did an autobiography and then he just did like an actual book of fiction. But that I'm, autobiography is really good until the trials start. Yeah. When he's suing his bandmates. Yeah, I know. it's. But the first third of that book is like, Dick, and I know it's overused, Dickensian. <laughs> Dickensian, yes. It reads, it, there's really funny. His voice is very uh, present in it, which did, I appreciate. Did you ever get influenced lyrically by more? Like, I know Not that you covered it. You like a train and you like the, the psychedelic furs, but with Morrissey, did you ever go back and listen to those? Because, I mean, it's about as witty as it gets. Yeah, I think he's one of the greatest lyric writers ever, ever. Yeah. I remember if 
there's an interview from like 82 or so where he goes back to the old house and like he's, you know, in Manchester doing his thing. And at the very end, the last like, you know, 30 seconds is he's like, I grew up dreaming that I would be famous and, and the best singer and songwriter and it all came true. <laughs> That's like the very end of the, the whole thing. And I'm like, mother, like you're too good. Like it's so good, it's too good. So, I don't know, like if you ever kind of, do you, do you carry... I'll tell you what I envy about uh, what what made me fall in love with Anthony Bourdain. Okay, I read Kitchen Confidential right pretty early on before the TV shows and the notoriety. It's like cooking school curriculum now. Like like they hand that out. Do they? Pretty much. Like you have to know it. Sure. So, well, but, I love that book. Okay. Loved it right off the bat, and I wasn't into food in a you know in the New York way or like right. In a, Sure, sure. It was the a little weird before food way now. was as, as big as it is yeah, now. Yeah, it's weird now, I know. But the what made me love it was when he referred to that lumbering classic, Beef Wellington. <laughs> He's talking about <laughs> cooking at a hotel in Midtown yes. early on in the career. Yes. And just that piece of writing, I was like, I like this guy. Like there's a lot of personality in the voice. It comes from sources that I think we shared. Like he read a lot of noir Oh, he's a huge Detective writer, fiction. absolutely. And the quality of the writing, as well as a book that is instructional mm-hmm. in a way, exploring something that wasn't really explored And, at that and time. like pulling back the curtain, like yeah. literally showing you what chefs think or what goes on day to day behind the scenes. Like I was no, glad cool, he was right? found success later. I was like, totally deserved. I was, I was talking about this earlier. You know, you have like a, a Gordon Ramsay or an Anthony Bourdain or like, you know, certain chefs or musicians or, or, you know, people that they're good at their craft, but they're really underutilized. Like if Anthony Bourdain just made Beef Wellingtons or French onion soup all day, sure, it's good. But what a loss to society at large by not having him be out there writing. You know, like certain people are way better at entertaining and doing these certain things to just cook isn't enough. Josh, I'll be the first to say I am very glad that Graham does not just cook. Definitely. I mean, the dude is an amazing chef, but he does a ton of stuff. He's a really interesting guy. I would love to see this Blake and Graham cookbook collabo actually come out, man. We'll drop Talk House's first cookbook. I was going to say, Talk House better at least get a thank you for putting <laughs> this thing together. I'm sure you'll be seeing Blake at their show in Chicago. What is it? Uh, Eric on Ballroom on November 4th? Yeah, it's coming right up Sunday, November 4th. An amazing lineup actually put together by the Riot Fest folks. Jawbreaker, Naked Ray Gun, Smoking Popes. I'm flying in. (laughs) You better be here. Big thanks to Virgin Hotel for hosting this conversation. I will say I stayed there during Pitchfork Fest last year. That hotel is fucking awesome. And shouts to Blake Smith over at Virgin for making today's event happen. Today's episode was recorded by Greg Pansiera and produced by Mark Yoshizumi. Talkhouse podcast theme song is composed and performed by The Range. Listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and also keep an eye on the new events tab that we have at TalkHouse.com. TalkHouse puts on events from London to Los Angeles that are free. And if you enjoy the podcast, probably right up your alley. Also check out at TalkHouse on all socials for behind the scenes pictures, including some that you took at this event, Josh. That's right. Uh, Excellent photography from me. So get ready for that. (laughs) Till next week, I'm Ellie Einhorn. I'm Josh Modell. Peace. Peace.